because you're you're open-minded enough as a scientist to look at these non-conventional approaches, but you're also cogent enough to be able to take a scientific approach to it. And I think that's where science is growing. Because you know? there really isn't that much difference between biology and particle physics. It's just our lack of understanding that keeps them as separate uh, domains of study. You know, science doesn't have a monopoly on vision, it just has a monopoly on precision. Welcome to Business Game Changers. I'm Sarah Westall. This episode is really fun. I have some of the smartest people I've ever met on this show right now. Jonathan Leaf and Jeremy Pfeiffer and Max Champy. Jonathan Leaf, I gotta tell you, everybody's amazed with him. He has a codex that he's come up with for creating a language on how to map biology and particle physics and understanding how the whole universe is is the same with this codex and the language of the universe essentially amazing person and i didn't even figure out what it was that he was talking about as far as having this whole language of the universe until I got farther into the interview and i was just like you're talking about a language for the universe absolutely amazing i think you will be give it a chance to try to soak it in and understand what he's talking about and for those who are my patreons they stick around and they ask answer some more questions we have a really good discussion that continues after the show so if you support the program you can do it for as little as a dollar a month you can um, see some more information i will probably put this interview on public later maybe in a few months from now, but as for now, it'll just be an exclusive Patreon deal. But we're going to get into this interview now and hold on to your hats. It's a pretty intense interview and pretty deep into the science. I do the best I can as a translator to bridge that gap. My experience, as many of you know, is in computer science, computer engineering. I've done a lot of system design. And then I went into business and translating all that and understanding information and, and information analysis. And it does help me create a framework for understanding any kind of science and, and you know, language and environment. But <laughs> being able to translate some of these geniuses and being able to a- ask really good questions. I hope you're patient with me on this one. So let's get into that interview now. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the program. Hello. Hello, Sarah. Okay, so we have Jono, and we have Jeremy, and we have Max. You all, do, will you all introduce yourself? Go ahead, Jono. Uh, well, you know, all, all three of us have worked together uh, in, in the past. Uh, you know, we were consultants uh, in, in a think tank in Newport Beach a couple of years ago. And so we've just, you know, stayed in touch for, uh, you know, mutual inspiration and, uh, you know, and, and encouragement in, uh, you know, these cutting edge areas of science. So uh, I, I have a background in being a member of the Buckminster Fuller Institute back in the 80s. Uh, because Fuller was a, a very strong influence on me uh, during that period when uh, I, I spent about six solid years reading Synergetics 1 and 2, which were his two uh, sort of tour de force uh, volumes on, you know, philosophy and geometry. Wow, okay. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, John has been quite an inspiration to us. And then, Jeremy, you're new to the show. Max, we've had a while. So people should, listeners should hopefully know who Max is because we've, this is your, is this your third time on the show? Yes. And then, Jeremy, you're, you're new to the show. So can you introduce every, yourself to everybody? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, my name is Jeremy Pfeiffer and um, I work with water and consciousness and, uh, my specialty is sympathetic vibratory physics, which is an esoteric uh, late 18th century um, theosophy type science. And um, so I've have, I have a background. I've worked with uh, Masaru Emoto, and I've also um, worked with Gerald Pollack at the uh, Water Conference in Bulgaria. So I have a strong interest in water and consciousness and noetics and uh, um, I kind of come more from like the garage scientist aspect and 
some of uh, what I had dabbled in kind of, you know, brought some value to that science team that I worked with. And so ever since then, I've kept in touch with Max and Jono. They kind of tap me on the shoulder and, and they keep me around for inspiration. And, and I do the same. I mean, they're, they mean a lot to me. And, and this whole, this whole group uh, interaction is, is real special. And he works, he works with us at Y Mecla. He, he, he does some of our video editing. He runs a semantics lab in California, and we send him information to verify. And, in fact, he's here. We're at Live Longer Labs high in the, high in the mountains. He's here. We're doing – we're measuring consciousness through water. So that's what we're doing over the past couple of days. Yep. Well, let's get into, the, into some questions I have. Um, you guys, before, okay. I, before I do that – before I do that, can you um, move the camera so that it's higher because it's cutting off the top part of your head? There we go. Okay. And then make sure that you're close enough so I can – you're, you're going to have to is. sit closer than you feel comfortable with, okay? It's cozy. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Okay. Come on. Get over Quit here. Quit taking my light. Well, so I did some – I did some research, of course, before we got into this interview. And one of the things that, before we really get deep into water, I thought it was fascinating, and maybe you can help me understand this a little bit, is that human beings are, we're made up, majority of us are water. We fluctuate between 50 to 60% water. Women are about 55%, men are about 60%, but infants are like 75 to 78 percent water so they're a lot more water than than adults are or than children are what what is the deal with uh water and why does it change like that from the time that we're infants to being older go ahead john uh well as a general, uh, you know, expression, you know, water is so intrinsic biologically to the materialization process that if you look at birth, you know, as a form of materialization, you know, from obviously an egg and a sperm just continually growing, you know, during that nine month period, uh, there, there's a, a great deal of tensile strength and expansion and, and growth that's going on during that period. And, uh, and, and fat and muscle and bone are, are basically regulators of the body's energy metabolism. So, uh, so, so basically, uh, infants have an optimal body fat range uh, during three to six months of age. And uh, in the field of hydrodensitometry is, is what measures these, you know, sort of power to weight ratios that, that, that change uh, as the body matures, because obviously when, when you're entering, uh, you know, the, the, the environment in post birth, you know, from a watery womb environment into a physical, you know, environment like we inhabit as adults, uh, th this is a change in, in, in density. So, uh, so, so basically the, these, these body mass, uh, issues with regard to water, uh, are, are a function of growth, uh, and the, the fact that infants are growing very quickly. Okay. It, and I think as we learn more about how water works, it might be interesting to see that they have such a higher level of water and what that means. But uh, the other thing that I know, and you guys are really working hard on this, but the other thing that I realized through looking at all your stuff and is that water is itself an energy source and can be transformed into a battery. And you have made incredible uh, discoveries into that and have gotten to the point where you've been able to separate water to the point of in, into a battery form. Can you talk about that? Well, really, to understand uh, water, you have to kind of look at it from an architectural aspect. And, and in nature, you know, um, in a natural sense, water is not essentially H2O as, as we understand it in the textbooks. Just a quick break in the interview to let you know that April 4th, the seven-day free viewing of The Truth About Pet Cancer is going to be going on. So you don't want to miss that. Over 50% of our dogs and cats are not far behind are getting cancer. And this will give you the truth about what pet cancer is, 
how to keep your pets from getting cancer. And it's all free right now for seven days. So the link will be down below in the description and make sure you sign up now so that you can see it for free. So let's get back to the interview now. Um, it's actually, you know, interfacial in nature. You always see waters interfacing with a system or holding onto some kind of material. And when it does that, um, it creates a, a charge separation potential. So anything, anytime you have like a colloid solution, say like a mineral solution, um, or a colloid, you have like a negative charge that surrounds these particles and then it disperses much like a battery on the outside of that you get this bulk water that's, that's positively charged. So you have a charge separation potential, much like you see in a battery system. And so that differential actually has uh, a potential to, to uh, store and transmit and, uh, and, and give off energy. Well, and conduct I, energy. I've been doing research on alternate forms of energy as well. And, you know, people keep talking about wanting to look for free energy. And it seems to me that we have, there's probably way more, but I've run across three legitimate sources of energy. One being from the zero point energy field where they're pulling it, University of Colorado's um, experiments and patents where they're pulling it indirectly from the, the ether. It's zero point energy field is not the right term for it, but that's what people call it. Magnets, they've gotten magnets to produce energy. And then you guys in water. Now, how the magnets and the, I don't know how far the magnets are, but the zero point energy field, the indirect coming from the ether, they're very close to being able to have something that can go into manufacturing and actually go out into, into the marketplace they still need like 300,000 or something to finalize that process. They're so close. How far are you? Is it something that you could legitimately see coming onto the marketplace and being a source of energy? Max, do you want to speak from that aspect? We, there's a strong possibility it could come into the marketplace within the next year 12 months to a year, maybe a little bit longer. We have found in working with the water that we don't, we're not, I wouldn't say we're getting sidetracked, but we have found interesting anomalies and reactions in the water um, showing its ability to communicate and act alive. And with that being said, we're, trying to work with it in unison instead of forcing it to do what we want it to do, which everybody else does. So if we get it to, to come along gracefully, like we do with Wymecla tech and some of the things that we're doing, then, then you're not going to have a heat issue. Then you're not going to have some of the, the resistance issues that you find in other applications. So we've kind of taken a sidestep and right now we're, We literally are communicating through consciousness, through the water. We took, just an example, Sarah, we took last night same distilled water and we subjected the same water to certain historical uh, known energy emblems. And then we isolated the other part of the water from it and we can see a defined flow of energy through the water recorded with scientific equipment that institutes use and it's approved science and we can show that the same water depending on its environment or what it was subjected to reacts in a conscious way and the other water now tries to play catch up the water that wasn't subjected to that that field tries to play catch up and you can see the differentiation gap start to decrease because the other water is now learning from the from its sister that's in the other beaker that's absolutely incredible i've heard it be able to communicate <laughs> almost like across the oh. countries and oceans and stuff yeah that's they the 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 guy that won the 
the award. What's his name? Lucier or whatever. Oh, yeah. Luc Montagnier. Yeah, Luc Montagnier. Yeah. The DNA transferred from Europe to here. Yeah. I can kind of give us a quick little idea yeah. of how that might be possible. And then I'd like to hand it over to Jono because he's actually kind of um, mapped almost a codec or, or numbering system that kind of makes sense of it all. But essentially in, in a water system, you have what they call a proton tunneling effect. And that's very similar to like the Schrodinger work uh, of the quantum tunneling effect. And the proton tunneling effect is actually uh, sympathetic. It's like this non-local connection to the conscious observer. And so um, when you hear a lot of people talk about, you know, your thoughts can affect water or you can have an effect on a water system at a distance, um, it, it, it's it's by it's by way of the proton tunneling effect, and um, how I understand that it's it's also a connecting point and linked into a hydrogen state oscillation, and that's where I'd like to kind of hand it over to Jono because um, he he can really kind of wrap that up really nicely. Well, uh, I, I would say that as a general rule, just for uh, you know for the listening audience, that that water is a spiritual medium. And uh, it's very etheric. Uh, I I like to think that that water is, on the biological level, what light is at a purely physics level, uh, in in the sense that in in order to, you know, to derive charge and and battery potential from water, you have to split the hydrogen and oxygen components apart. And, And this is actually not even very well understood because... You know that there are people that are studying the oxygen evolving complex because it, it goes. You know, uh, electrons are basically uh, e- extracted in units of four at a time, because in in, in a water complex you have eighteen uh, atoms total. You have two hydrogen and sixteen oxygen, and so uh, so basically just returning to this notion of the spiritual medium. Uh, if you think of water as a materialization force or or form within which uh, image is developed or evolved uh, in the same way that you have to split light into electrons and positrons, uh, you know, which is what an event horizon does, you know, uh, roughly at the center of every galaxy. This is this is its means of producing the, the time continuum and and the charge continuum. Uh, there are these connections that, that are very obvious between how life is being formed on the planets uh, spiritually and, and how information and imagery is being evolved and, and charge separated at the level of, uh, of a galaxy. Because basically what, what you have is a, a solar system which is driven by a star, you know, with, uh, you know, planets around it. And then at the center of a galaxy, you, you have... A, a, a black hole. This is this is basically known uh, that that black holes exist at the center of all galaxies, and so it's uh, so it's a mechanism by which imagery as spirit is is evolved through chemistry, uh, where water is the central factor because it it contains these very specialized what we'll say numerical properties of hydrogen and oxygen, where where hydrogen is the number one principle in the periodic chart, and, uh, and oxygen is number eight. So with regard to what Jeremy said earlier about, you know, the, the, the codification of water, uh, w- water is basically made up of ones and eights, and, and these are charge paradigms within the, the number system that, that allow, uh, quite similarly, for, for light to be split into its electron and positron, you know, charges. So, so that that might be a little bit, you know, over the top uh, it, well, in, like in terms said, of abstraction. Like you said, it's really obvious. <laughs> I'm kidding. Keep going. I had to throw in a little <laughs> joke there because at one point you said it's, it becomes really obvious. But go ahead. Oh, well, yeah. just, just to kind of quick to, to, to just to before Jono gets back into it. So the idea of water being interfacial and connecting everything together. So whether it's material matter or consciousness is the great interface. It kind of brings everything together. So that's kind of gives you a more simplified idea. Well, let me, uh, yeah, so let me ask you, let me ask you, if water is, if we're made up of so much water and water can almost communicate to each other, like you said, if one water is a certain way and the other one, it, it like 
changes its whole construction to go to another way. That's the concept of us learning as a herd from each other as well. Totally. It's totally. It's a total mirror. I mean, it's that's fast. what we're thinking yeah. is the, the uh, medium for that to happen. Yeah, it's happening right now amongst the four of well, us. Y- you have to realize that b- because light is a non-local continuum, it's non-local, uh, that if it has an equivalence with water, that then water is going to have these non-local properties that, that have, you know, ver- very bizarre forms of connective potential as well. Can you connect that to the proton tunneling effect, Jono? Well, uh, the, the, the proton is obviously made up of three quarks. And, uh, you know, this is two, two up quarks and one down quark. And it has v- very special, uh, we'll say, n- numerical codification that, that modulates uh, w- within spectral functions. So, uh, so, so it just so happens that in the system of codification where, where the proton uh, up, up down code is actually six, six, seven, where, where, where the numbers six uh, signify the up quark and the down quark is the number seven, you have this sequence six, six, seven for, for two up quarks and one down quark. And that six, six, seven just so happens to also describe the number known as the gravitational constant. So the gravitational constant is the number six, six, seven. So, uh, so obviously gravity is an interpolator for, you know, for, for force and, and placement and, and the control of, of image and information and, and all sequencing in time. So, uh, so, so there are global functions that the, the proton has that particle physics isn't even aware of at the moment, simply because it, it wouldn't acknowledge that there are, you know, codifications within the quarks. Can I ask you, you're saying they're codifications. So is everything codified? Are you starting to realize a pattern that if you put a number to it, that all these things are actually codified? Well, absolutely. 100 percent. You know, uh, you know, Walter Russell said that 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 time is the conversion of the simultaneous into the sequential. And so, and so the word codification is just b- basically one that you could substitute for, for sequence. So does it you make, know, you can almost, tr- you could eventually transfer, just like we figured out the DNA sequencing, you can almost start figuring out some kind of mathematical sequencing for all of this stuff that would help us make sense of everything. Yeah, and just real quick before Jono picks that back up and, and details it in regards to the codec, Essentially, what we're talking about is the nature of vibration, oscillation, and spin. And so this codification, and when he's talking about the up quarks and the down quark, these are points of expansion and contraction in a tensor state in between that. And so, you know, Jono can talk more about the codec, and and maybe we should segue into the idea of the jitterbug from Buckminster Fuller, because I think that fits in really well with the carbon C60 concept and, and, and things. So go ahead, John. Uh, well, architecture and geometry is, is a form of spatial sequence. So, so when you have systems like Buckminster Fuller, you know, what was known to have popularized, such as the jitterbug, you, you have what is called a breaking of symmetry. Can, can, you, know, you, can with, with, you hold on one second? Can you talk about what the jitterbug is before you get too much into, just so people who are listening have a point of reference and then get right yes. back into what you're talking about? Yeah, yeah. The, the, the jitterbug is an idealized array of points, okay, that, that fit into a closest packing constellation. So you have one central point or sphere, for example, you know, around which you can cluster 12 additional points or spheres. Now, now when you ha- have those spheres touching one another in, in a three-dimensional array and you connect the centers of all of those 13 spheres or, or points, okay, because it's basically 12 surrounding one, okay, you get a structure known as a cube octahedron, okay, w- which has the, the facial surface properties of squares and triangles, and so it, it was discovered by this famous uh, Canadian uh, geometer named Coxeter uh, that this form can actually uh, expand and contract. 
And, and, and because uh, Buckminster Fuller had Coxeter as his hero, he actually popularized the cubohedron uh, in, in his writings, in Fuller's writings. But, uh, but basically, it's an idealized energy array that, that has the ability to contract and expand, not, not unlike a heart you know, in, in, its, in its pumping uh, capabilities. So, so this is a, a pure abstract geometry that, that, that was referred to by Fuller as the heart of hearts. And, and so it's, it's tied inherently to the number 13, which is obviously, you know, uh, traditionally considered an unlucky number, but which according to Fuller, you know, was simply a very powerful number, which historically the, the masters, master thinkers will say, uh, didn't want other people exploring the mysteries of and so they, they they put a curse on the number 13 even though it was simply one that was you know quite revelatory oh that's really interesting because the reason it has so much power is because of this yeah yeah it's it's the 12 around one and of course you know mystical traditions like the masons and you know uh, all all of these you know i mean the founding fathers of this country uh, you know, use that 12 around one, uh, you know, symbol that I think they, they still have on the dollar bill. You know, uh, I think it's a, a Masonic tradition. I'm not sure. Now, do you, have you seen evidence of an ancient Egypt or, you know, like the pyramids or ancient structures elsewhere that show that our people in the past understood this concept? Because you mentioned, I mean, it kind of points to that, that they didn't want people to talk about 13. Well, well yeah, I mean, uh, the, the people that wanted to control, you know, the, the power wanted to control the wisdom. Uh, I'm, I'm sure that uh, it's, it's not unlike, you know, the, the misfortune of the Alexandrian library in which a lot of, you know, very precious information was lost. But, uh, you know, but the interesting thing is that as far as Egypt goes, you know, science, you know, has never had a monopoly on, on vision and, and understanding. It's had a, a monopoly on precision. But, uh, but in antiquity, you know, there were, there were plenty of, of insights that have hung around for literally thousands of years. You know, if, if you look at, at, at the Chinese, for example, you know, their, their low shoe magic square, you know, was considered an oracle. And so the equivalent of an oracle back in the day was what we today call a theory of everything. So uh, antiquity, you know, has to be respected for its, its its vision and insight, especially when these ideas tend to hang around for for so many centuries. You know, their, their shelf life is is very 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 long. Well, especially if it ends up being a, a real basic concept in science that we're finding and. It, it's pointing that they had incredible knowledge that we're just starting to uncover. Yeah, well, they, they were certainly open to a lot of ideas that science, you know, with its arrogance is closed off to. Um, you know, I'm not saying that, that science is doing a bad job. You know, it's just that it has to operate with, with a very high degree of skepticism, you know, because of the nature of its analytical tools. So can we get back into the concept of water being energy and the fact that you started to realize that our own body uses the water possibly as an energy source and the blood going through our veins actually might be partly because of the water and not just because of the heart? Well, you got to think of it, you know, from that idea of architecture and how um, the the potential, that charge potential we were talking about earlier is differentiated. And so there's this, like I said, this tensor state, almost like a, um, um, how, how would you say, John, like a corpuscular type action um, where where there's this, this oscillatory function that happens between push and pull. Um, where where that actually guides the the systems um, along in, in in terms of like cell signaling or um, say a heart pumping or the the, 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 the the breathing in of our lungs and the breathing out of our lungs that's all guided by the same type of uh, vibration oscillation and spin um, 
construct, this domain that has this this jitterbug to it. So do you yeah. think that it's being communicated from a, a, an outside source telling our body what to do? Well, and so I just wanted to kind of, uh, you know, get deeper into the idea. So what's, what's the cause um, of this function? And so we got to look at maybe some, um, some type of, you know, outside influence, maybe cosmically, you know, influencing the sphere of the earth and, and how they interact together and how there might be some kind of like, perhaps a standing wave phenomenon that takes place with this tension state. Uh, and maybe that helps guide some of the forces at play that kind of um, hold, hold everything into place on, on this planet sphere and actually guide along that oscillation process. Um, you know, maybe Jono maybe can, can clarify a little more of that. Well, I, I think that, uh, that a quote possibly of, you know, Johannes Kepler, I'm not sure, but uh, the, the quote was basically that geometry precedes creation. And, and so when you have a design, a pre-existing design, you know, for, we'll say, the lattice of space-time, uh, you know, th these place, this places constraints on the types of motion that can evolve within that geometry. So, so for example, with regard to the body, uh, you know, it's now known that, that blood, in, in some sense, exists prior to the heart, and that they're both made uh, of the same materials, uh, embryologically, that is. So that uh, so that the heart, you know, grows as as like a piece of solid state hardware that, uh, that that arises from the dynamics that are inherent within blood flow. So that in terms of water, you know, having a certain type of dexterity, you know, having a very high intelligence charge dexterity, you, you could say that that the heart and the blood, in the way that it pumps, you know, is a function of of water's dexterity. So we're thinking water is a bigger controller and instead of the heart and everything else controlling water, it might be the other way around. Well, you know, life is certainly, uh, you know, contingent upon the availability of water and the intelligence that's inherent in water. Because uh, for, for example, the, the 64 codons that codify uh, the, the DNA and the RNA and ba basically, you know, the descriptions of, of biological form, uh, all of them are contingent upon the way they interact with water, either hydrophobically or hydrophilically, uh, you know, to describe th these very dynamics or, or dexterities. Communicating back and forth, telling water how it's going to grow and water, I mean, it's like almost a, it's very interesting. I, I'm simplifying yeah, it quite a bit, exactly. trying to ask questions, and I'm trying yeah. to hang on and trying to follow. But anyways, who was... No, I think this is a great conversation. This is, this is really good stuff. And it takes us back to that idea of interface. And, and I think so, you know, the idea of architecture is really, really important in terms of uh, material, uh, material science, applied sciences, understanding these geometries um, and, and how they interface um, with these fields and these mediums that, that kind of can be engineered in ways that they can, they can maximize potential. And I think that's where we're, we're going in terms of, you know, growth in, in material and applied sciences is, is how, we can, how we can better design uh, and organize these architectures to support these natural functions. Well, which we need to do for our community, like a perfect example is 5G that's not resonating with our bodies and the wireless technologies and, and so many things that we're doing that just isn't right for our body. If we created different ways, we, we all want the really fast uh, download speeds on the internet, but we need something that actually resonates smoothly with our bodies and and we just, 5G is, from everything I hear and all the studies, is not it. And it's going to harm us. And that's a perfect example. If we understood more, we would be creating things that are harmonious to us. Yeah. And we'll start to see more breakthroughs in science when we start working with, with, with a you know, more uh, organized architecture. And, uh, and these interfaces start to, they start to, the cogs start to link up more efficiently, so to speak. We start to figure right? out. I always say we just don't know how we work. I say it in a really basic, we don't get it. But we don't. Yeah. We don't understand. So now as more people start to understand how our body chemistry works, how water works, 
and how these how bad do you think it needs to get with like 5G and some of these things before we realize hey let's put the let's change this technology and get something that's more harmonious for our body i mean cuz we have our food we have you know the technology we have so many things that are just not harmonizing with us and it's because we we're we don't under we're farther along in some of our technology uses than our body like we're trying to do things that our body can't handle and so yeah. it's we, how bad do you think it needs to get before we say wait a minute we have to do things that work for our body and for this planet yeah well i think we're at the cusp now and i think that's what's going on is we're we're kind of hitting this kind of critical point where we're hitting a boundary condition where um, eventually we're going to have to graduate into another uh, uh, expression of, of a, a more organized, um, you know, substructure or architecture that supports, you know, a more healthy and organized way of, of functioning. And so I think it has to get bad before it gets worse. And I know that's pretty, you know, you people know, have to die in mass right before we're like, oh, my yeah. God. Yeah, and if you look at it like, you know, a natural system, you know, you have these circadian rhythms and these periods and cycles that kind of they express themselves and, you know, they build into these, you know, harmonic organized series and all of a sudden they start to become disharmonic and then they, they, they break into a whole nother level of expression. So I think that's kind of following the, the natural wave function that in a way. That makes sense to me. Okay, that, that actually makes a lot of sense. Okay, well, let's get into your alkaline versus uh, acidic understanding because you are redefining how the body works with alkaline versus acidic. And, and we're looking at it, the way the textbooks and science talk about it is backwards from what you say it really should be. Well, and, you know, it's not just me alone and, and us doing this alone. You know, this is kind of like we're moving into a whole new a whole new realm where there's a lot of people like us, you know, working on this type of technology. So yeah, we're, we're, we're researching everybody's work and everybody's kind of looking towards us and we're all inspiring each other. So I just wanted to kind of to reiterate yeah, that's that. But, that's great. Cause that means it's moving. It, there's a whole yeah. field that's moving forward, which is wonderful. And we happen to be talking to top experts in the field, but everything, if you're all by yourself doing it, it's, it's not yeah. as, as wonderful yeah. <laughs> as a whole field that's moving forward. So in, in regards to your question, I think um, a way to kind of position it for the audience, because, you know, how do you apply this to your life, all this theory and understanding is, you know, a lot of people for, you know, right now are looking at like, you know, the alkaline state of water as, you know, just a number. And they're not looking at it from what the water's holding on to, that idea of interface and the ability to create that architecture and coherence where the, the body can actually deliver nutrients or the water can actually deliver uh, nutrients to the body because of what it's holding on to. And I think that's where people need to understand um, that, that alkalinity um, is really more an idea of what, what it's, what the water's holding on to. So if and it's holding it on to, can hold on to. So if it's in a certain, yeah, if it's, if yes. it's higher, it can hold on to different things than if it's lower or vice versa yes. and you know, shed and so if, add, go ahead. And so if you are trying to create an alkaline state with your water, you want to do it, you know, as nature would intend. You want to do that by, you know, um, adding minerals to your water. And those minerals can actually help with creating that, that structure of the water and it could help with uh, delivering nutrients to the body. And it could do it um, in a natural way as opposed to, you know, say like a Kagan machine where it just does it, you know, uh, via like electrolysis. Yeah, it will create a certain pH uh, in an alkaline state within within the water, but does that really offer anything to the body? Does it really give it that architecture and that information to where that 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 you know intracellular matrix can 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 absorb what it needs as far as information? So I think that's how people really need to start understanding you know alkaline state in water is is from what it's holding on to. So what does the Kagan machine not do that it sh that will well, make it valuable? You know what I'm saying? It does. It doesn't. It doesn't add any minerals into the water, and I think that's kind of what what it's missing out on. I think there's there's obviously efficacy to the Kagan machine because um, it does create a certain state of alkalinity that the body can use to you know it goes through and, and and I guess in a sense chelates the body 
um, and, and, and acts as an antioxidant, right, in the body, much like, I guess, the carbon C60 molecule. But it doesn't really offer any nutrient value. It's not balanced. So I think when we're talking about, like, systems design and stuff, we gotta, we got to go back and look at what nature's actually doing. And, and what nature does is you have that nucleus that forms in the sky and it falls to the earth and then it goes into the aquifer and it becomes it starts to become mature and then it rises up and then it it it, it rises to the surface of the spring and a certain distance from the spring is when the water is mature as it's kind of meandered down the stream it's picked up the minerals and it's become a mature water and that's the kind of water that the body actually oh, uses the nutrients it's for- like it's like um, when it rains, it filters all the way down to the aquifer, and then you, you tap into that aquifer to get your well water. And as it's filtering yeah. all the way down through all the minerals, layers of sediment, you're getting all those minerals and stuff into your water, just like plants and stuff would in the soil. That's the water's picking up all those nutrients in the soil and getting right. it into the plant. It's doing the same thing to you. Exactly. So, so in, in terms of like a Kagan machine, yeah, it's 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 almost like using like an immature state water. It's like the earlier part of that hydrological cycle. That's sure it'll offer you some some of that antioxidant effect, but it's not really a mature water that would 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 bring you the information that the body needs. And so that's kind of that's going back to that idea of using like you know um, like an ocean trace mineral that you can supplement into your water to help, you know, create that interface to where the body can absorb it and absorb the nutrients and the information from it. But doesn't in a higher alkaline state, like what um, the Kaga machine does, it allows the hydrogen um, when you're taking C60 or it's also adding hydrogen to the water, it really acts as um, a way to help heal your cells with oxygenated stress. It, it which does. Is, which so is what hurts us the most. So what the Kagan machine and what C60 is doing is it's like pumping yourself with hydrogen, which on this planet, in our bodies, we need that to deal with oxygenated stress. Yeah, exactly. So there's a lot of efficiency there and there's a lot of use for that. But eventually, like, you got to go back to, like, you know, um, you know, you know, basically exercise, healthy diet, and just kind of the basic building blocks of a healthy lifestyle. And that's essentially what's going to keep you in health. So, um, you know, there's only so many magic elixirs you can take that'll that'll kind of get you to where you need to go before you actually need to, like, put in the real work. Oh, yeah, um, you, you know. can't sit on a couch and just eat potato chips and watch TV and drink Kagan water and take C60. But if it's... Yeah. If you're if you're yep. doing that hydrogen water with C60 and you're doing all the other basics eating well you eating well and exercising it can really be amazing right Absolutely and I think Max can speak a, a lot on that too Well we talked about that with Dr. Loretta just last week when we did the video Sarah Yeah, yeah. and the effect it's having on her in a physical realm and she said the basis of it was her diet but then this was what put it over the top were the additions of what we were talking about, the correction in the water as well as the C60. Yeah. And that's really important too, because let's be honest, we're kind of, we've gotten to the point where we're a bit lazy and complacent in our world now. And we kind of do need these like elixirs and in, in, in these go-getters to kind of use us to use, to be able to take us to that level to where we can see, okay, there is, there is a, a level of health that we can get back to, to where we can start exercising again. We can start, um, you know, that motivational process to where we can start eating better. And, 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 and with that, our consciousness starts to grow. So, um, yeah, sick. it is. I mean, our people are sick. I mean, honestly, we have a sick society and well, I like the fact that the C60 and the hydrogen just being on this planet with the oxidated stress helps us, but we have bigger issues too. Oh yes, definitely. Definitely. Well, if, if, if I could, you know, uh, add a little something, uh, you know, because obviously this, this all relates to anti-aging, uh, you know, it, in, in terms of the sickness, it all depends on how we define our work. Because obviously there, there are so many people that aren't enjoying their work. Uh, and, and if you look at the classic equation for what work is in terms of like a Newtonian perspective, you know, where, where you have, uh, you know, mass 
multiplied by distance. You know, what, what type of work are you doing, right? So, so with regard to the C60 in terms of its strength, you know, when, when, when you impart strength to, to the cells, you know, then they're able to work better. So I, I think that a lot of uh, the, the sickness, sickness comes from the fact that the people are not enjoying the work, you know, the effort that they're putting in to their life, you know. And then, of course, uh, you know, this this might relate to perspectives on how they view their body or how they treat their body. But, uh, you know, j- just in preparation for th- for this discussion that we were going to have today, I, I was uh, I was looking at some some of the history on the C60, w- which goes back to uh, to Peter the Great in the 1700s, because there was a very special magical spring, you know, wh- wh- where this water flowed over this this material known as shungite, and and the shungite contains uh, natural amounts of C60 in it because it's mostly carbon. It's like 99% carbon, and so. Uh, you know, I think that these are these are ancient perspectives. Not that 1700s is ancient, but uh, you know, clearly mineral water was what was a favorite uh, going back a few hundred years, and probably the reason why the bottled water industry in France and all those European countries got off the ground. You know, a couple hundred years ago. Well, can I ask you if you just get shungite? Because I've heard people in the comments and different things talk about save yourself money and just get the shungite you can do it for pennies is that true that you can get a different version of c60 with just using shungite and it would be really beneficial well shungite in itself is beneficial but it's uh it's less than five percent c60 molecule that's isolated and we kind of any of the C60 people, well, I'll say, I'm not going to say any. A majority of them take the research where they completely isolated the C60 molecule from the other carbon molecules, and that's what they did this rat test that everybody talks about. Okay, we do not know what the other application of some of those, C- the, of some of those carbon molecules are to the structure of the human body. Um Shungite is less than 5% C60 from the research that we've done. So you may be getting a minute trace of its effect. And we even, we even have it in our water around here at the lab. So we, we've taken some of that historical data. We're working on C60 that is suspended in water. We, we're working on a lot of things for other applications. But... To get the value point of the oxidative stress value that C60 can do as its structure by itself because of its covalence bond versus shungite, no, you're not gonna you're not gonna see the results in shungite that you see with C60. It's not even close. It's not even close. No. Okay, I just want people to know that that they, they can get some benefits, but it's it's just not the same thing. No. No. You're doing a study right now as we're speaking on water. Can you explain what you're doing right now? I'll let Jeremy do that. That's why he came up here. Uh, yeah. um, <clears throat> so we're here in Max's lab, and we're doing a series of experiments um, using electrochemical impedance spectroscopy. And it's a, for, a, a, a conventional form of measurement that we can use um, to analyze the spectral properties of water. And um, we do that by creating a certain uh, AC current and impedance level within this water. And that translate, translates into an RMS value. And it's those values that we can, um, we can look at um, over um, a certain um, experimental group um, compared against a certain control group. And we can see and identify certain characteristics um, on the physical level of water, you know, the material properties of water, and even on the conscious properties of water. And uh, a lot of what we're doing here on this trip uh, is we're working a lot more with the conscious aspect of it. So as you can see behind us, we got a Faraday cage all set up, and, and we're doing these isolation experiments where um, we're subjecting uh, conscious observation um, and intention work into water, and we're able to see it on our uh, spectral analysis. 
And so right now we're actually just for fun. We set up the spectrometer and we're running a continuous measurement mode where we're able to see um, how maybe the water is actually listening to our conversation at, at, um, as we, uh, as we chat here. And we're actually seeing little spikes at certain times um, over the, the logarithmic uh, time domain. And uh, it's, it's really fascinating. It's, it's, a, it's, it's a really great study. And the cool thing is, is since it's a semi to a conventional means of measurement, um, the conventional skeptic scientists, they can't really ignore it. They have to kind of look at it. And it gives us a lot of data that we can explore uh, scientifically. Have you been able to map out what different emotions uh, start to have a uh, map of what all the different emotions actually look like? So that when, well, that, are, when when we're having a conversation, you can almost see it in water from an emotional yeah, that's, standpoint? Yeah, that's kind of what we're kind of mapping out now. I mean, it's like, you know, it's a huge undertaking and we have to amass tons and tons of data and we got to spend tons of time looking at it and trying to organize and, and, um, and, you know, and control as much as we can of the experiment and, and, and organize all the variables so we can start mapping those out. So, um, yeah, we can do that and we are doing that, but, you know, we have to, we have to, uh, to, to, to organize our variables accordingly. So for example, you know, maybe if we spent the whole conversation topic talking about one subject and one topic with some very certain keywords, and then we did the same thing on another show, then we could start to organize our control groups and our experimental groups um, in a more organized fashion. You know, then then the picture starts to build and, and you can it's start to run. It's too complex now. There's too many variables of what we've been talking about. Too many doing. variables. Yeah, yeah. That makes sense. but just the fact that we are seeing an effect alone is uh, very important. We're, we're, we're knocking at the front door of, of uh, scientific revolution in this type of work. Now, can you tell that certain people affect the water more than others? Like they might have a lot more emotional presence? Yeah, uh, we tend, I mean, even in the circle we run in, I mean, a lot of us are, you know, we've done a lot of work, you know, spiritually. Um, a lot of us are kind of awake, and that's kind of why we're actually doing the type of work that we do. It's like we've been given the the responsibility and responsibility and gift to usher in these new sciences and these new philosophies um, because we've done a lot of that work. And so, a lot of times when we're doing these experiments, we're we're in these groups of, of really high, high, high conscious level, coherent uh, states. So, yeah, we'll see uh, a lot, a lot more. Um, intense results compared to someone who's just kind of like off the street and, and is not really coherent, of, you know, in, in terms of what we're, what we're up to. Oh, that's excellent. I don't have that much time left over so we can fit it into an hour show. So I was hoping you could stay and ask, answer a question for my patrons and we can dive more into the work you did on emotions. And you worked with Dr. Emoto. How did I, did I pronounce yep. it right? Dr. Emoto. And he, can you, we have like five minutes here. Can you explain a little bit of what you did with him? And then we can get in with our Patreons more on answering a couple questions. Yeah. Well, I have a background in uh, news and documentary and communications. Um, that's actually how I ended up doing this is I ran into uh, the idea that water can hold consciousness and uh, I, I was doing some work with cymatics and I was creating these these images through vibrating water and refraction of light and, and seeing these 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 modes of vibrations expressed in these in these vibrational patterns that looked much like water crystals. And so somebody had seen some of my work that worked with Dr. Emoto and, and had reached out to me and said, gosh, these vibrational patterns, they sure do look a lot like a water crystal. And I said, oh, that's interesting. I said, yeah, I, I agree with that. And I think there's this underlying idea that modes of vibration are inherent to, you know, how water crystals are formed and, and whatnot. And uh, they, you know, they took interest and noticed that I had this communications background. So they said, hey, do you want to maybe come in and help us with Dr. Emoto's educational initiative to disseminate his knowledge to a greater audience? And I said, I would love to. Uh, it's, it's what I'm interested on, in, in already. And I said, I'll do that. So that's kind of how I got started working with him was, is packaging these informational modules to disseminate his knowledge. Um, so I didn't really get a chance to work with him in the lab, 
But what I did do is it opened up um, a whole new world to me, and, and, and I had a lot of questions. So those questions kind of guided me to some other mentors and people and, and uh, inspirations of which I've stood on their shoulders and, 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 and peered in, into and across the veil to see deeper into what we're researching. And those are people like John O and Max and Dale Pond and Gerald Pollack. And the most interesting thing about it is a lot of the people – with, they're, they're kind of at the interface of conventional and non-conventional. And I think it's at that interfacial point where most of this growth happens because you're, you're open-minded enough as a scientist to look at these non-conventional approaches, um, but you're also cogent enough to be able to take a scientific approach to it. And I think that's where science is growing. And that's, that's kind of why... Absolutely. That's, I so love we, that d- description because if you're more just kind of esoteric and you're not putting a form around it. You have to put form and structure around it so that you can make sense of it. If you don't do that, then it doesn't allow us to go forward and build on it and make sense of it and prove it. Yeah. Out. Yeah. And that's kind of, so that was really what happened with Emoto's work. Like I knew in my heart that Emoto's work was right on the money, but I needed some science to back it up. So I kind of went down that rabbit hole and so you'll notice there's a lot of like really important science work that's going on that has is actually um, showing the efficacy in what Emoto was interpreting, and so he was he was a very very good intuitive in, in in the idea that he was able to interpret what he was um, observing. You know his scientific process was a bit iffy, but um, thank God there's scientists out there that have, have taken on some of the work and, and really kind of proved out what he was doing to have some efficacy. That's excellent. Okay, well, thank you so much. Let's um, let's stick around and do a couple more questions. And how can people learn more about you and get some information? I want before we end this, I want to make sure we get that out to listeners. Uh, well, I'll let Jono kind of hit it first. If if you're interested in um, any kind of like you know quantum codec or any kind of mathematical or number or numerology. He'd be the, the go-to for that. So I'll let him start off with his research website. All right, Diana. Uh, well, uh, you know, my, my background, uh, you know, was obviously Buckminster Fuller. You know, he was sort of like my graduate, you know, training, you know, program uh, in, in the early 80s. Uh, and, and so I migrated from, from Fuller's work into the realm of particle physics and uh, and then from particle physics in terms of a mass energy construct or, or understanding, uh, I, I went into bioinformatics, w- which is the, the study of DNA, the genetic code and, and how biology interfaces energetically with matter. And uh, you know, essentially they, they use the same mathematical constructs because there really isn't that much difference between biology and particle physics. It's just our lack of understanding that keeps them as separate uh, domains of study. And that's, uh, let me, and let me, and you're saying, you're saying they're very, very similar. And that's where you're talking about the codex. Are you pretty far along in getting that codex put together so that people can start understanding that this is all works, this, I mean, it works the same. It's all interreacted. Plug your book, Jono. Well, well, a- a- absolutely. Yeah, I'm, I'm very far along because, you know, I, I've obsessed over this stuff, you know, in a very disciplined manner, you know, f- 14 to 16 hours a day for 20 years. So uh, so I have been very disciplined in trying to bring this to fruition. And and, and, it, and, it, and it's not that difficult to illustrate that the, the numerical systems that were used by ancient people uh, in their manner of creating what they called theories of everything or oracles of the day. You know, I mean, they, they did have mathematics available to them. Uh, it's not like math was just invented in the last 100 or 200 years. Uh, you know, m- math has been around for, for thousands of years, and, uh, and there were basic understandings of nature, uh, su- such as principles of balanced summation, I'll say that again. That's balanced summation. So this is like the basis for the early matrices uh, that they they use to describe systems. So, for example, as I mentioned before, the low shoe magic square, 
you know, th this is this is the first form of mathematical matrix that was considered a theory of everything. Most people don't even know that it is based around the golden mean. And the golden mean is something we haven't even talked about yet today, because this is sort of, you know, the, the, the paramount principle of uh, of of uh, well, uh, of geometry, of architecture, of, of mathematical logic that's responsible for codifying all aesthetics from the level of, of energy matter into biology. So, so when you look at these early matrices, it's easy to see uh, how the DNA is the same expression uh, as the particle physics, you know, mass energy spectrums that have been known and numbered for the last 50 years. Um, so, so basically, the, the work began with studying and codifying the, uh, the spectrums of mass energy that have been studied in the particle physics, and then just simply, you know, taking those systems of number and applying them to the DNA, because uh, th there are systems of codification that apply to the 64 codons of the DNA that, uh, that basically unite the two fields you know, biology and particle physics. I think that's amazing because everything now is about the crossover of fields. You know, we, we cannot, we have to get out of our silos to really move science and understanding forward. You have a book that you wrote. What is your, how do people get your book? And you have a website. Well, the, the, the truth is, is that, uh, is it because as with architects being involved equally in the arts and the sciences, uh, that, that, the, the only website I have right now is, is for an art book. I, I don't really have, uh, you know, the, the, the science website up because because the book on, uh, on the science, the pure science is uh, under some revision because all the bioinformatics stuff is, is being added to the physics. So uh, I, I would say that this, the science is not really available for, for mass consumption uh, at, at this very moment. Okay, so you're working on a book that, did you have it and then you needed to, you took it back off the market to, to upgrade it, or is it just hasn't hit the market yet? Uh, I, I would say that, uh, that it really hasn't hit the market, because I, I, the, the truth is, I, I only made 50 copies of the first book back in 2011, uh, and, and then people became interested in trying to patent some of these ideas, uh, and so it, it basically was removed from any public viewing. Uh, and, and then, you know, I, I went into the patent world uh, and, and from, you know, and from there, uh, well, you know, I, I have to use art in order to recover from too much headbanging, you know, because in, in, the, in the field of science, you know, you have to be right about things, you know, and in the field of art, you don't necessarily have to be right, you know, you just have to exercise good, good judgment or good taste. So well, you don't even uh, have so to do I'll, that, you know, <laughs> from what I'm seeing nowadays. Yeah, well, that that's very true. That's very true. Okay, so you have a website for that. Let's get your website up. Let's get back to them for the website, and then uh, we'll wrap this up, and then we'll get into more stuff. And you can – I have a feeling there is so much more that we could get from you that is – we have to figure out how to be able to communicate it to people because you are way beyond where the average scientist is, let alone the average person. Well, well thank you. You know, I, I like to try to, you know, say things in as simple but most, you know, comprehensive way possible so that, you know, the, the information is, is received, uh, you know, in good order. <laughs> Well, and, and sometimes it's hard because the basics of what you're trying to do, the basics of your, I mean, mapping biology and physics is really hard to communicate to people because they don't even understand the basics of either, you know, or they might understand the basics of one and not the other. So that's just a challenge in and of itself. I, I think the bridge is, is truly art, you know, because, uh, because design science you know, as architecture, you know, stands as that medium, you know, that that works both equally with the sciences and the arts. And so for people to understand that, that everything in nature, in, in biology and life is a design, that it has an appearance, that the appearance is actually codified, you know, by sequences, li literally spelled, 
you know, uh, you know, the, the ancient, you know, Christian mystics that spoke of, you know, uh, the, the word, you know, in, in bioinformatics, sequences of codons are referred to as words. Uh, and so there, there are these bridges of, of analogy that, that one can make. And, and as I said, uh, you know, before, you know, science doesn't have a monopoly on vision. It just has a monopoly on precision. So do you have a website for your art book? Give me your website. Well, yeah. Okay. The, the website for the art book is, is simply theposterbook.com, you know, because I had this fascination and love for, for advertising and the psychology of, of advertising and, and art. So, uh, yeah, so, so I put together a, a, a fabulous book that Jeremy has a copy of uh, that we've actually done some, some pretty interesting work developing as well, you know, visually. Well, I think sometimes uh, the best artists are scientists. I've, and almost in my experience, I have computer science background, and the best people that I've worked with I have, love music or art or something else. Very abstract thinkers. It's my experience. Yeah. Yeah, architects have been my heroes in the past. You know, Buckminster Fuller was an architect. You know, some of the people that uh, that he made an impression on that, that carried on the work, uh, you know, were also architects. Um, you know, architecture is fabulous because, you know, especially if it comes to a living space, it's, it's something that you get to, to be around and enjoy on a daily basis, you know, continually. Okay, Max and Jeremy, let's hear how we're going to be able to get hold of you. So if you want to reach me, you can get a hold of me at info at veravitasupply.com. And uh, I have a background in products, goods, and services um, that are focused on, you know, longevity science and uh, specifically on ocean trace minerals. And so like we were talking about earlier, how do you create the alkaline state within water naturally and then you know it could give you the minerals um, and the nutrients that your body would need uh, we created a platform veravitasupply.com so you could go on there check out some of our products um, I wanted it to be mostly focused around information because we're like information freaks we love to research and we love to teach people including ourselves and so you can not only go there to purchase a product like the minerals, uh, but you can go there to learn tons of things. And, and um, I work with Jono and Max to create and formulate some of these articles that we put together to educate and inform people. So um, that would be my humble plug, uh, respectfully offered to the masses. And um, it, a lot of it comes uh, by support of uh, Max's company too, Live Longer Labs. He's really been a big support in, uh, in helping us to bridge um, the gap to the audience and whatnot. Because he's got a greater audience. Well, I have some more questions that I want to ask you. So stick around, and thank you so much for joining us. No problem. Thank you.